Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, loyal listeners, to another episode of the HRSA podcast. We are joined here today by Nathan Kring, local entrepreneur and newly crowned father. Uh, <laughs> What's up, guys? Um, I'm your co-host, Tommy, and I'm joined today by... Jenna. My yep. co-host, Jenna. Um, and so, Nathan, um, got a few questions here for you. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, your education, where you're from, where you worked. Yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I love coming yeah. back to campus. Uh, every time I come back, I'm just floored by how much this campus has changed because uh, I'm not that old, and I can remember when I was in high school, you didn't come to IUK. It just, no one came here. Mm-hmm. You came here if you were a 35-year-old single mom to get a nursing or teaching degree, honestly. <laughs> right. That was it. it was a non-traditional <laughs> right. college for right. older adults, and now I look around at the amenities that are being added, including the uh, activity center, and they just finished a bunch of apartments down the road, which my company worked on, and I just love what they're doing around here, trying to make it a non-commuter traditional regional campus, which is great. So thanks for having me. Um, Some of you may know me. Um, I was a professor here for five semesters, six semesters, maybe I lost count. Um, But I did my MBA here, got my undergraduate degrees at Wabash College, all-male school over in Crawfordsville. Um, I have a bachelor's in Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies from DLI, and I'm wrapping up my dissertation um, in economics and marketing at Liberty University. So that's kind of my educational background. No one really cares because it's super boring. Um, It's an education (laughs) podcast. I think it's super relevant. Well, (laughs) everyone uh, tends to equate uh, education and your educational attainment with being smart. And uh, I've quickly learned being around academics that – Just because you have an enumerated degree after your name doesn't mean you're smart. In fact, sometimes it means the opposite. Kind of an idiot. So I know some people that I wouldn't necessarily say are super bright that have big degrees, but never mind that. Yeah, Uh, yeah. Uh, But (laughs) I'm I'm from here, so. Oh, sorry. I'm from Tipton, just a tiny town up the road. Um, Again, yeah, I've left uh, after high school to go to college, and immediately after graduating, I joined the military. So I've been coast to coast and around the world, Europe, Middle East mostly uh libya so and now i'm back home and back in good old tipton indiana you did mention that uh you have a what did you say you had in arabic um, i have a um, bachelor's degree in middle eastern studies in arabic i'm, I'm fluent in arabic um and, and posh too which i learned after but that's what i was going to ask because uh, we were just talking before you got here about how how many languages do you speak well so arabic is everyone who uh, from morocco to Syria, to the Gulf, they know MSA because that's what's in the Quran, Quranic Arabic, Modern Standard okay. Arabic. So if you know that, then you can start learning dialects. Each dialect technically is classified as a different language. So if you count all the dialects, probably really good, I'm good at five. Mm-hmm. But decent, I'm good at probably eight. Okay. Um, but, you know, if I go to Morocco and I say something in Modern Standard Arabic, they understand me, but when they start talking back, I'm not really good at Moroccan Arabic, so I, I get lost real quick. <laughs> but they understand everything I say. So. That's, that's good. I can get to the bathroom and order McDonald's. I'm good. Right. So the important stuff. That's right. right. The, the keys. Priorities. Um, did you use that when you were in the military? Did you do translating? Yeah, I was a translator. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, it, so, yeah, go ahead. you have anything else to add to that? or? Me? No, I was just okay. curious. <laughs> All right. So um, I guess just from knowing you as having you um, as an instructor myself. and I'm kind the of... second worst instructor ever. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I, I enjoyed I your class, so. but yeah. um, no, but I know how much you juggle because we've had those conversations mm-hmm. before and obviously like we're connected on LinkedIn and things. So I can see um, kind of your background. You, you've got a lot going on. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you, you've the lead quite a few things. So how do you manage all that and juggle um, all that at the same time? Well, my wife would say by not, by, by driving her insane. So, you know, no, yeah. I make I make sure that I'm home, and when I'm home, I'm home. I think that's important. As you get older in life and you start having a family, you got to be able to hang it up when you walk right. in the door. And I used to bring my laptop home, and I'd stay up till midnight, and I was like, my mental health was suffering. And I said, I'm being less productive. Right. So I made a goal to not bring my work home and hang it up. But to juggle things like I, that I've been doing, uh, I don't know if any of you guys may know or not know, I own several businesses. I'm a city councilman, and I'm the VP of operations for a tech company. Um, And I can only do that because I have management and leadership underneath me that I've trained that honestly allows me that flexibility, that I know when I delegate, things get done the way I want or the things that need to be done for the organization get done the right way. 
And if I didn't have those people underneath me and train the way that they need to be trained, I wouldn't be able to do half right. of what I do. And you'll find that in life. There are good leaders, bad leaders, but if you become an owner of a company, you have to train people the, the right way. I am glad that you said that because I've worked in management before, you know, just like managing restaurants and stuff. But but a lot of the um, same principles apply that I have seen managers get really stressed out over their workload because they have not trained anybody mm -hmm. under them to be able to do anything. So they end up having to do all the work themselves. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I've always been a big proponent of a big, big believer that training is one of the most important things that you can do Absolutely. As, a, as a leader to make sure that people have your back, you know, that if, if something goes wrong, that you have people you can rely on. So. Absolutely. And I think uh, it goes a long way. I mean, you guys learn in classes what motivates people, motivational leadership tactics. And frankly, those are good, in my opinion, to, re to read and learn about. But when you become an adult, you're not going to change someone into someone they're not, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. If you're motivated by money only, you're going to continue being by motivated by money only. But there are a certain group of people out there that are on the cusp of being a great leader that oftentimes it's more than money. Money is always going to be a factor. Mm -hmm. Exchange of value for your work is important, but you need to give people a sense of purpose and then show appreciation in, in their performance review. Um, so that's the only way to maintain, like these managers talking about getting stressed out. They may make great money. You may work at Chrysler, make 90 grand a year and be happy with the money, I promise you within five years you're going to be burnt out. Mm -hmm. If you're not happy with what you do, you don't feel appreciated, and you don't feel like there are opportunities for training, advancement, you'll leave. And, and that, that happens. Yeah, so. and you know, that it kind <clears throat> of sort of ties into something that we've talked about a lot in um, like organizational behavior classes and stuff. Um, a lot of the younger generations that are rising up in the workplace value feedback. They don't respond unless they have that necessary feedback and, and, you know, critiquing on their job skills and things that they can mm -hmm. improve upon in their performance and stuff. So I just think that that's super interesting that that's that, like you said, money's always a factor. It always will be. But as the generations have come and gone, you know, that's just one thing I've noticed for like the I younger agree. generation mm -hmm. it is different. It, that's, that's true. I've noticed definitely. It, and I've been reading right. articles about yeah. it that, that, um, millennials and Zoomers tend to be Zoomers. <laughs> you haven't heard that Zoomers, Gen Z, whatever, whatever you want to call them. The millennials and the Zoomers, they uh, they they tend to be um, more concerned with uh, uh, fulfilling work. Yeah. So I, I'm not gonna get hit with an okay boomer. I'm not that old. So oh no, no, no okay, no, no. good, good, good. <laughs> I'm sorry, good. that's the first time I've heard Zoomers. Zoomers. I've heard wow. me too, but I, I knew what uh, he was uh, referring to. No one else. Yeah. <laughs> Just boomer, so maybe it's maybe I'm just too old, you know. Yeah, that's okay. you got an old soul or something, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? Okay. Well, it's funny you guys talk about this because I, I frankly think these conversations are way more important than where I got my MBA, Those, right? That's boring. Right? I do, and I don't know if anybody remembers. I, I do, always do this thought experiment, I try to remember to do it my freshman, where I get people and say, All right, I'll pay you 20 bucks an hour to walk out of this classroom right now and go dig uh, a shit ditch. And no one raises their hand. And I don't expect them to. And I'll, okay, how about 40, 50, 100 bucks an hour? And inevitably, I can get up to thousands of dollars an hour, and 10 people won't raise their hand. And I'll say, why? Why? And then to me, it's this generation more than any generation before, I think, cares more about being fulfilled in their life and their work than they necessarily do care about money. Right. Now, I think every generation cares about certain degree of money. You need a certain degree of money to maintain a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But I think this generation, more than the, the boomers mm -hmm. who are put your head down and work and shut up, mm -hmm. right. you guys are saying, no, I'll take 70, 60 grand a year if I feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. Yeah. And exactly. that is something that scares the workforce right now. Mm -hmm. You see all the time, they're like, we can't fill jobs. Maybe because the jobs pay 50 an hour and they're boring. No yep. one wants to restock a shelf. That's why everyone's coming up with new ways to automate that. Mm -hmm. How about I work on the technology and the engineering on the machine that restocks the shelf? Right. Or I do things that connect information to people that makes them happy. So your generation is, I know, hated by the older generation and half hated by my generation. But you guys are engaged in like collective bargaining on a generational scale, and I love it. Right. It's awesome. Well, and another thing is just like, our younger generation having the autonomy 
to be creative with mm-hmm. how they do their job, whether it be stocking a shelf or, you know, mm-hmm. however, whatever you're doing, as long as you have the autonomy to have your supervisor be like, you know what, here's your assignment, do it however you want, just get it done. You know, it doesn't have to be that mm-hmm. head down, work hard type mentality, as long as you have the autonomy to do yeah. what you want. Yeah. When I was first starting, like, you know, graduate high school, getting into the workforce, I was like, I don't know, I don't know if I want to do a, a day in, day out, menial sort of thing. I want something that makes me feel like I'm actually doing something. And right. I felt like I was a crazy person for something. Right, exactly. Wanting to add out, value. Yeah, it wasn't until I found out that just about everybody else in Irish thinks <laughs> right. that. I was like, okay, right. good. I'm not alone in this. Well, you, you guys are certainly bucking the trend. But if you walk down these halls of any high school or even at IUK, think about why the the seats and the, the chairs are in lines. Anybody know why? It's a remnant of factory days of when you guys were, people were brought in and taught with a ruler, this is the way you're going to do it. Shut up. Don't ask questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we still have relics of that old way of doing things. And if you look in the corporate world, the corporate world's kind of changed. Flexible spaces. Uh, I just got back from uh, an AIG subsidiary in Manhattan. Fully stocked coffee bar for free. Lunchroom Mm -hmm. free. Everything's about flexibility and collaboration. That's right. Because... That's not the way humans were actually intended to work. Right. And I think eventually college will catch up. And I think hopefully in our lifetime, high schools catch up. Because <laughs> right. that's what, to get to the second question, builds strong leaders. Right. We are not meant to sit in rows for eight hours listening to someone drone about facts and memorize those facts to be regurgitated. Right. And critical thinking, as I've taught all my students, is the most important skill. Changing with the workforce, being able to think on the fly as technology changes and society and culture change, that's the most important key you could ever bring out of this college. Not that you memorize a quarterback formula and you could tell me what the four P's of marketing were, even though I asked that every <laughs> Yeah, class. I was going to say, I think that was on an exam. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grill you later on it. So yeah. Know. <laughs> oh, jeez. This is going to be a quiz. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, speaking of um, leadership style, um, who would you say in particular, like what individual – do you think has been your greatest inspiration in shaping your leadership style? Mm, That's a good question. I don't think I could ever pinpoint one. I think every, I have different leadership styles I've identified and tried to mimic and emulate in the military, in college, here at IUK, in my family and my friends, because everyone has a different leadership style that fits in different elements. So in in my undergraduate, it was Dr. Hartnett and Dr. Um, um, Dr. Hartnett, and I keep wanting to say Dr. Cox because he's one of them and he's here, but Dr. Hartnett and Dr. Kubiak. In my military, it was it was um, Captain McGrath and First Sergeant Espinoza. At home, it's my father and my mother. Um, and then, you know, here at IUK, it's Dr. Smith, it's Dr. Cox. And if I think about all of them in totality, they're all knowledgeable without being arrogant, but they also do what Captain McGrath used to always say and, and First Sergeant Espinoza, they lead from the front. If you look at a good leader, it's someone that you could look at and say, that's the person I, A, I want to be, but they're not telling me to do stuff and then sitting back and waiting for me to do it. In the corporate world, a lot of executives do that. Mm-hmm. They tell their VP, CEO or the CEO says, hey, go do this. Mm-hmm. And then the VP goes and tells another leader to do it. And it eventually gets down to the chain. The best leaders will say, I'm going to do it with you. We're going to do this together so you know how to do it right. And then... You know, let me know if the team needs help, and I'll even come all the way down to the lowest level accountant, and I'll sit with them and explain it. Mm-hmm. And that's what a good, a good leader leads from the front and is knowledgeable without being arrogant. And they make you feel valued. They make you feel um, heard. They make you feel appreciated. And, again, that comes back to how do you juggle so many things. You have to instill good leadership in people. And then, of course, I, I read voraciously. So <clears throat> General Patton was a good leader. You know, Teddy Roosevelt was a good leader. So you can always read about – great leaders and then try to, you know, take things they do right and put it in your leadership style. Yeah, that's uh, – That kind of goes I, into the next question. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. No, so, I mean, like the question, it's uh, how can one improve upon their leadership skills? And, I mean, I think that that ties right into that. Yeah. Because as I mentioned earlier about the whole autonomy thing, people having the freedom to kind of be creative um, – and, and do their job how they want, there also has to be a necessary degree of direction mm-hmm. because, yeah, you can have the 
the freedom to do your job however you want. But if you don't know how to complete yep. the task, that's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So I agree. That, that, that just reminds me, like, I guarantee you everyone in this room, besides me, although I did this when I was your age, you're scared to death about walking in that first day of the job and saying, are my skills from college going to translate? Or am I going to be sitting here looking like a, an idiot because I don't know what they're talking about and college didn't prepare me? And you hope that that leader takes you and says, I get it, where you're going to be fine. Right. But if you win, if and when all of you become leaders, because you're all going to become leaders in some capacity, in your home, at church, if you go to church, at work, wherever, um, the, once, the best way you can improve your leadership skills is to take a quote that I used to give you guys by Cicero to heart. The more I learn, the more I learn, I know nothing. Never stop trying to be a better leader by learning, reading, listening to your subordinates, your peers, and, and the people above you, and always think before you speak. If you can listen and, and kind of package the information before you talk, you will always be a better leader. Never say things emotionally in the workplace, especially not at home. It's definitely not the place to do it. But, there, I mean, there's tons of ways to become a better leadership, but I think the best one is, is listening and then always trying to learn how to be a better leader. I like that you mentioned um, being able to learn from the people under you. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that goes with what you were saying about, um, how, how did you phrase it, knowledgeable without being arrogant? That's right. Right? Yeah. Um, because you you might know more than the people under you. It's You probably it's, do. You probably do, yeah. But uh, they're going to have insight that can prove to be valuable. They might have a way of doing something that you never thought of, and it exactly. turns out to be way better than the way you've always done it. Well, and you know the that whole saying about, you know, just because – you're a boss doesn't mean you're a leader. That's right. In mm -hmm. order to, in Boy, order to, <laughs> well, in order to have people or to lead people, you have to have people that are going to follow you. And mm -hmm. if you're just bossing people around from the top, then nobody's going to. All right. You got to lead from the front. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. No, you're, you're, you guys are both um, exactly accurate. I mean, I think that the re the way you learn from the people under you e everyone is a conglomeration of their life experience mm -hmm. and and no one's life experience is the same as anybody else i don't care if it's your neighbor and because of your different heuristics and life experience you offer a different perspective on life on work than your leader and oftentimes because of the way we do things in america you're shut out you don't have autonomy so people are like i don't want to hear from you <laughs> that's a bad leader you're leading from a, a place of, of arrogance, honestly. So right. you can always learn from the people. Now, there's a tactful way to address your boss. You don't mm -hmm. go to your boss and say, look, dumb, dumb. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm better right. than you. But, but uh, um, if you guys work for someone who won't even entertain your idea to make the company better, you should probably find a new job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even factories are changing. We do a lot of work for Corteva, which is now uh, Pioneer, bought by, uh, Pioneer was bought by Corteva and Bayer. And even they, big, huge seed companies and pharmaceutical companies, down to the lowest level, say, well, let's get some feedback from the low-level people on what we could do better on our processes and, and workflows. I have had, not not calling anybody out, you know, but I have had um, managers where I'm like, hey, this way that I'm doing this, this thing is working. He's like, no, don't do it the way I told you. And then, of course, it doesn't work at all. Well, why, why do you think that happens? Uh, in that situation... Uh, it's because I think it's because you get a manager, you get a person who is got a big head about themselves, mm -hmm. a huge ego, crazy arrogant, and they surround themselves with sycophants and yes men um, who will not tell them anything otherwise. And so they just get it in their head that they are always correct and that their way is the only way. And so anybody that comes in and tries to be a naysayer or contrary mm -hmm. or come up with their own ideas, that person obviously is just going to be trouble and they need to just be. I, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, but I think there's one more element. Like if you think about it a little more mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of why everybody's had a boss they didn't like or a professor, uh, even a professor. Mm -hmm. What happens when you're right? The way you wanted to do it was right and better. Now your boss or your manager mm -hmm. looks like he's the un unknowledgeable one. Mm -hmm. And if he's scared to be replaced or you promoted over him, mm -hmm. it's toxic throughout the chain of leadership. Mm -hmm. And that means it's probably coming from the top or he's just a jerk. 
which is always possible, especially in certain industries. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you think about human nature, I don't, if you're my subordinate, I don't want to be wrong. It makes me look bad. And that's uh, bad human nature getting involved and making bad leadership worse. But I think that's the core of it. A bad leader is going to tell you no every time, even if you're right. And that means you probably should look for a new job. I'll be honest. I like it when the when I turn out to be wrong and somebody else has a better idea. Why? Uh, because it means that uh, it, it means that honestly, it, it, when I've been in leadership situations and somebody else has had a better idea, it means that I feel like I've done a good job at training them. Yeah, it that's makes true. me feel yeah. like you know I've not only have I set them on the right path, but now they're starting to figure it out for themselves, and that means that I can take a little bit more of a hands off approach. Yeah, uh, which. Uh, honestly, the less work I have to do, the better. <laughs> but yeah. it's good. it's what's good for the organization. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The more good minds that you have working on a project mm -hmm. or working on a problem, the better off the whole thing. Yeah, gonna... organizational buy-in is a big, big thing. And bad leadership chains usually have bad organizational mission statements, and and just it's just a bad organization. You can right. usually tell. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it, but it's often in retail. <laughs> Anybody who, who's worked retail, that, right? Yeah, we could be on that for an hour. If you work retail, you're dealing with customers that in rural places aren't very nice. You're always wrong. Uh, the customer's always right. Mm -hmm. And you're making next to no money, mm -hmm. eight fifty an hour or below. If you're lucky. Right. If you're, if lucky, you're lucky. Right? Exactly. Lucky right here. Who wants to deal with people for eight fifty an hour? And then nah. people wonder why are there kiosks popping up and automated cashiers. Yep. And it's not a mystery. Yeah. They act like it is. It's not a mystery. No one wants. People hate dealing with people. <laughs> well, yeah. In retail, at least. Um, so actually, uh, like, like I said, if we, if we talk about retail too much, we'll be, I, we could go on about that for a long time. Um, so I'm actually just going to move us on to the next question if that's fine with everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so how have your interests in business swayed or changed over the years? Oh, uh, well, I never wanted to own my own business in college. That's, I, I went to co it's a funny story. I went to college first to, um, I was going to be a priest. Mm -hmm. That lasted about six months, and I said no. And I went to college originally to play football, and I majored in classics, which I was one of my degrees. So, uh, you know, I was stoked. And after about six a semester, I lasted. And I said, you know what? I still want the classics degree, but I think I'm going to be a doctor. So I started taking more chemistry classes, and then I took the MCATs, and I did mediocre to poor. And I was like, you know what? I really don't want to be a doctor either. And thank goodness I'm at a liberal arts school. Because I well bashed liberal arts, so I took <laughs> you take everything, and I was always one to four credits away from another degree if I wanted it. So then I kind of right. switched, and I started doing some econ and Dr. Um, uh, Howland's classes, and and I liked that. And then um, you know one day I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna join the army. That sounds good. I like language. <laughs> I love languages. Um, I loved being athletic. Um, so I a friend that I lived with, we were gonna go join the U.S. Army. And we drove there, and I had made up my mind, and I went in first, and I came out, and I said, hey, are you going to join? He said no. So Thanks, he, he, he hung That's me good. out to drive. But he's now a state <laughs> police uh, detective, and he's a great guy. And uh, I was already committed. So even then, okay, I joined the Army. I loved language. I was like, this is my career. Mm -hmm. I'm going to serve 20 years in the Army. I love this. Didn't even think about business or marketing. Who cares? Uh, I'm living the best life. Right. And then uh, I got sick. I got medically retired. I'm still considered a, a disabled retired veteran, so I get a pension. Mm -hmm. And I came home, and I was like, well, maybe I'll be a police officer or firefighter, and I like public service. And then my, my counselor, my veterans counselor, was like, well, why don't you go get your MBA? I was like, yeah, I've always, I mean, I went from Wabash, and then I was basically in college in the military, and sure, let's get my MBA. I came to IUK, and it's something about, you know, Dr. Rink's classes, Dr. Cox's classes. I was like, something's telling me maybe I should just, maybe I should give this thing a try. And I got a job as the uh, economic development director in Tipton. And at the same time, I was like, you know, what? I'm going to start a business. And I started doing a commercial cleaning business and hiring people. And next thing I know, I'm doing construction cleaning. And we have, you know, over two dozen employees just at that business. And I started a consulting business that has um, a million-dollar client now in Groomsville Popcorn. It's like, it just happened. I don't know what happened. I mean, just all of a sudden, and I'm like, I can't imagine doing anything else. But it took a risk. I mean, uh, it's a tough risk. It's a big risk to start your own business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no matter if it's just you're selling T-shirts, you're saying, this is me. It's the, it's the one thing you can do where when people reject you, you take it personally. 
You know, if you work in a factory and someone says, hey, this widget is not as good as this last widget, you don't take it to heart. But when when you try to sell stuff and someone says, "I, I don't like that. Or I hate your product. You take it personally. Yeah, that, that, I came up with that. You know? Yeah, it's yeah. you. It's an extension yeah, of you. Exactly. So when you become a business owner or an entrepreneur, you take things super personally, mm-hmm. and you got to learn to kind of separate that. But it also motivates you. I mean, you're motivated every day. I'm so excited every day to wake up. Every day is different, uh, depending on what I'm doing. I haven't even touched on the fact that I'm a VP of a tech company, which is great. I travel a lot. <laughs> it's so much we'll fun. Get there. <laughs> but um, so my interest went from none to I am fully immersed in business and marketing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, couple, and I, and I love it. Couple different uh, yeah. avenues there too. So. And I love it. And uh, and I'm even involved in the public sector as a city councilman in Tipton. So I mean, business has become nothing. It was nothing. Hated it. Didn't even care about it. To it's my whole life now. Right. Yeah. So. Um... I guess I, I'm super interested in your military experience because, I mean... So boring. I, well, to people who don't really know much about it, it, it can come off as super interesting. So I guess I want to yeah. know, know how your military experience has helped your leadership style in general and how it's helped you be this great entrepreneur and, and tie everything in. Um, well, I mean, the one thing you... If you're going to be in the military and you don't fail out a boot camp, you're going to be disciplined. Yeah. And it's going to carry true. with you your whole life. You're going to wake up every day early. You're going to make your bed. And you're always going to leave time during the day for professional, personal development. I right, read every day, even if it's 20 minutes of the newspaper or 20 minutes of a book. I read every day. Mm-hmm. And we learn that in the military. You always have to be working on yourself. And that's obviously going to help your leadership style. So when I start reading, you know, I just finished General Chaos, which is Jim Mattis' book, his first biography. I learned a lot from him about how he was talking about how to deal with troops. Mm -hmm. Well, I used to have to do that, but then you can translate that directly into business. How do you deal with peers? How do you deal with subordinates? How do you talk to people? Um, So so you get discipline in the military. It's the one thing you get. And you'll probably see these on listserv and... I don't know, Lad Bible, whatever you young kids are reading, whether BuzzFeed, <laughs> you see these lists, these top 10 things to do that these billionaires do to be successful. Mm-hmm. It's always wake up early and read. It always is. That's what successful people do. Don't equate success, though, with money. I mean, there are successful people in academia that aren't rich. So successful people wake up early and they read. And the other thing you're going to get in the military is rigidity, which is important. But rigidity that also requires flexibility. So in my life, I have to have rigidity. I have to have some structure. But in between that structure, I have the flexibility to do what I need to do. So it's not, hey, 10 to 11, I know I'm doing this, and 11 to 12. No, it's this is the general flow of my day. And in between, I have to be flexible to put out fires and do things for my businesses. So I learned that in the military. And then lastly, it's, it's how to deal with people. Above you, below you, in the military, everything's super precise. You have to call people by certain names. Mm -hmm. And you learn how to tactfully address your uh, superiors, cordially and helpfully address your uh, your peers and your subordinates. Mm -hmm. And that way we communicate in the military translates great into corporate America. So, and then aside from in the military, you have to learn to do things under pressure. And, you know, it's not easy to operate when someone's yelling at you or... You know, there's explosions, there's gunfire. You're not going to get that in the corporate world. Right. Unless you're going to get someone yelling at you. So. Metaphorically, maybe. Yeah. yeah. D- d- depends on the corporation. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to work for that corporation. <laughs> right. Well, you ever yeah. RoboCop? I mean. I love RoboCop. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So, you know. Yeah. Those are dystopian future movies. I love them. So. No, I, I, I mean, I could talk all day about my military experience, but I think those three things are the, the big things that are the takeaway. And honestly, you don't have to go to the military to get them. They're just forced upon you in the military. Right. <laughs> you have no choice but to call a sergeant a sergeant unless you want to go, you know, spend time uh, after work mopping and cleaning bathrooms till midnight because that's what you get. Peeling potatoes. You yeah, know. doing the fun <laughs> stuff. Yeah, KP duty. So, uh, yeah, you can do that from non-military stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do it right here on campus by leading clubs and, and engaging with your peers and, heck, just be nice to each other, you know. Listen to what someone else is saying and try right. to learn from them. Yeah, for sure. Because there's there's actually knowledge and bad information too. <laughs> there is. Someone can tell you something you know is stupid, and you can listen to it. And 
you think about it, why did they say that? What background are they coming from? Maybe they just don't know better. Failures can be almost as valuable learning experiences Absolutely. as successes. Sometimes more so. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. It's just a just a little bit of wisdom from your uh, local HR. Dropping, side, right? dropping <laughs> knowledge on it. Yeah. It's true. I can't tell you how many times, like, it's funny you say that. We just, uh, we did some work for a, a general contractor in Bloomington, Illinois. And I had a bad feeling when I signed the contract. And we did the work. And now afterwards, like, he's trying to nickel and dime my company. And I just, you know, I learned. I said, okay, I need to do a better vo- a job of vetting out-of-state clients. Mm-hmm. It's a failure. I failed my team by signing a contract where I really didn't know the company. Right. But I learned a lot by saying, you know what, in the future when we do out-of-state work, I need to do a better job at vetting. Because mm-hmm. I put a lot of strain and time and angst on my team, and I paid for it. I mean, I, they had to take two days off a week. Uh, the following week, and they were mad at me, you know, which they should have been. It was I was there with them. Now, I didn't send them solo. Mm-hmm. This was a couple weeks ago, and um, so there's definitely knowledge to be gained in failures, mm-hmm. and knowledge to be gained in people that you perceive as ha- knowing nothing. You should honestly listen to everyone and then try to decom- decomp what they're saying and why they're saying it, because from a psychological standpoint, you're going to want that as a leader. You know, Taryn comes to me and says something that I know is just factually untrue, I can engage in a, dis- a civil discussion with him, and then I can start thinking, all right, well, why did Terrence say that? Why did he, why did he think that was Why true? was he so wrong? <laughs> Which is never true in my class, at least. Terrence was always right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's right. things, things like that. Um, too, too often, um, I think we get roped into this dichotic world that you're right or you're wrong. And a lot of times that's true, but there's still value in what people have to say. That is, uh, that's some really good wisdom, and I think we'll... Uh... We'll uh, end on that note. Awesome. Uh, is there any final words you have for our uh, loyal listeners out there? Nathan? No, I'm definitely going to share this on my social media. And uh, Sweet. <laughs> I, want, I, I used to have Facebook. I actually deleted it, and it's been the best decision I ever made. I don't have the gram, but I have Twitter and LinkedIn. And uh, if, if there's one thing I can keep, keep telling IUK students is get your head up. Like, Don't bury yourself in your phone. Get your head up. Try to engage with people around you because you will learn more from your peers than I could ever teach you in a class. If you just start talking to each other Mm -hmm. and exploring the world and exploring information and having civil discourse and debate, you'll learn more from each other than any professor will ever teach you, honestly, about life and engaging with people uh, way more than a textbook could t- plus textbooks are worthless but that's another topic <laughs> don't tell primary IUK. sources yeah don't tell only. IUK that primary sources only IUK should just get rid of the bookstore and only sell the original sources of information but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try I'll there talk to go. Dean Krabinoff maybe we can <laughs> right. get books all right. Well, that's uh, that's all we got for you guys today. Thank you so much, no, Nathan. Thank yeah, you guys for thank you. Me and uh, talking with us. A lot Appreciate of, it. Like we said, a lot of valuable insight there. Um, so go ahead, everybody. Uh, give us a uh, give us a like. Go ahead and subscribe. Whatever platform it is you're listening to, and uh, we will see you guys next time.